So why are we more often than not afraid or unmotivated to share about Jesus? Ministering to others, particularly non-Christians, isn't easy. There are many barriers that we face, whether they're cultural barriers, attitudes, personal abilities, or something else. I, for one, sometimes think, oh, you know, is it worth the effort? I don't really want to get hurt. They might not listen. So how do we overcome these barriers? Today, Tiv and I will be exploring our topic of a journey of perseverance in chapters 17 and 18 of Acts during Paul's third missionary journey. After leaving Philippi at the end of chapter 16, Paul and Silas travel to a city called Thessalonica. Here, Paul preaches to the Jews with confidence about Jesus, and as a result, many people become believers. Although some Jewish leaders heard Paul preaching, and they became jealous of him, and they send an angry mob. And when they didn't find Paul, they end up persecuting Jason instead. Paul then leaves Thessalonica to prevent further persecution towards the Christians, and he writes to Jason and these Christians so they can still continue their ministry of Jesus. The takeaway message is that despite being met with resistance, Paul and the Christians persevere. Even today, we as Christians can continue witnessing no matter what we face, we can persevere as well. From verse 10 of chapter 17, Paul leaves Thessalonica and goes to Berea. The people there met his ideas with open minds. And the point is that in Berea, Paul had nothing to fear. He didn't really have to venture beyond the borders of unfamiliarity. And the Bereans were receptive and curious about Paul's ideas, and they actually searched the scriptures to see if what he was saying was true. And many people were convinced. And Paul even convinced some pretty prominent men and women of Berea as well. But again, when some Jews from Thessalonica heard that Paul was preaching here, they followed him there to create trouble again. So the believers in Berea encouraged Paul to leave, and so he made his journey towards Athens. Evangelical pastor Rick Warren once said, familiarity breeds complacency. In other words, we might not realise what things are familiar or come easy to us, until we encounter a challenging situation. Although Paul has faced a lot of persecution so far, his missionary journey has been one of familiarity. So Paul at this point has now entered Athens completely alone and is introduced to an entirely different culture to the one he knows. Now culture is very complex. There isn't actually one set definition of what it is. But to summarise, Culture refers to an abstract concept that, re that reflects the shared beliefs, ideas and values that are characteristic of a society. So this can include things like beliefs, uh, communication, food, all sorts of different things. Paul faced a very challenging audience in Athens. The people there were cultured, educated and generally quite modern. And they were also convinced of their superiority. They thought they were a little bit better than everyone else because they were so modern. And people in Athens spent all of their time discussing the latest ideas. And it was a city famous for Greek philosophers such as Aristotle and Socrates. So the point is that the people in Athens are very progressive. And this is very unfamiliar to Paul. He's, he's very traditional. So when he's presented with these progressive ideas, it's very unfamiliar to him. Facing unfamiliar things in life can be challenging for anyone. Naturally, we as human beings don't enjoy change and we don't enjoy navigating unfamiliar territory. It can be very confronting. So when Paul was preaching in the public square, some Greek philosophers heard what he was saying and they were confused and curious about his ideas. So they decided to take him to the High Council out of curiosity. Paul's address to the Council is the pivotal point of capturing the attention of the Athenians and convincing them of Jesus' ministry. 
And again, Paul knows that he's facing a lot of pressure here. And that's because he's presenting ideas and beliefs that don't really conform to Greek culture. It may have been at this point that Paul realises his approach needs to be different while he's in Athens. And that's because Paul is experiencing a significant cultural jump here. So to give you an illustration, let's say we have a young Australian pastor who has an Australian sense of sarcasm. And this pastor is then transferred to a church in Iceland, let's say. And while he's preaching his sermon there, he says something like, Judas Iscariot was a great friend to Jesus, being sarcastic. But because his audience doesn't know this idea of sarcasm, you can imagine the, the confusion and perhaps horror among his congregation, all because they interpret what he said differently. And this is all because of a cultural misunderstanding. Paul is facing this exact risk while in Athens, this risk of a cultural offence or misunderstanding. Most of us would probably shy away from situations like this because we're afraid of offending someone. And when we are presented with situations like this, unfamiliarity makes a quick appearance again. I know for me, you know, I tend to avoid situations like this because I'm petrified of offending someone or having a bad reception. But Paul provides us with a good example to follow. But as I said before, Paul knows that he has to address the Athenians differently. And he has to do this very spur of the moment. It, he doesn't go into Athens knowing beforehand that everything is going to be different. It's while he's in Athens that he realises that people here are different. So when he is preaching to the Athenian council, he begins by being culturally respectful yet somewhat provoking. He ties Greek culture into Christian truths. And he says in verses 22 and 23, Men of Athens, I notice that you are religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines. And one of your altars had this inscription on it, To an unknown God. This God, whom you worship without knowing, is the one I am telling you about. This was a, a very smart and tactful move by Paul. He was both appealing to the Greek culture and subtly challenging it at the same time. And he actually did this several times. He, he also quotes Greek poets when he's illustrating his point that God shouldn't be depicted as an idol designed by craftsmen. Paul's use of language, illustrations and quotes in his sermon is an example of cultural adaptation. Paul had to adapt or adjust his sermon method and content to be easily understood and well received by his Greek audience. So far, while he's in Athens, his sermon has been focused on God and creation, whereas previously on his missionary journeys, his sermons were about Jesus. And this may have been a part of his method to adapt his sermon while he was in Athens. So Paul then continues his sermon here by talking about the topic of death and resurrection. Unfortunately, this topic was a prominent area of disagreement for the Greeks. And this leads to a more negative response from his audience. I mean, really, Paul was on a roll here. You know, he was being culturally adaptable, appealing to their culture and subtly challenging it at the same time. And then he mentions this one topic of death and resurrection and the discussion ends. That must have been very frustrating. But Paul is known as a perfect and kind man. And there is no doubt that he is. But he's also a human being like any one of us. And he makes mistakes. But through his mistake, the Holy Spirit is guiding Paul here, showing him that he needs to be culturally adaptable and aware. It says in verse 27 that his purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. Some people in Athens did believe Paul and others didn't. So does this mean that Paul's sermon was a success or a failure? 
It was by no means a failure. Although no church was established in Athens at this point, there were believers that did arise, such as Damaris and Dionysius, and Paul definitely learnt an important lesson there. It is said that a picture is worth a thousand words, and this picture you see on your screen certainly applies. It depicts a group of people at an international arrival section of an airport, and they're all greeting each other in different ways, but they're also confused about how the other person is greeting them. And this picture illustrates obvious cultural misunderstanding or a lack of cultural awareness. Although it's often unintentional, we as people and as Christians tend to try and connect to others of different cultures without really knowing what their culture is. Australia and the whole world is multicultural. This means that we need to structure our abilities to minister and witness in a way that is appealing and relatable to people of all different cultures. I would like to challenge you today to assess your methods of witnessing and to incorporate an ability to be culturally adaptable. Overall, Paul at this point in Athens needs to develop a new approach to sharing the gospel. His experience here in terms of encountering a new culture or a new audience shows him that he needs to develop his skills as he travels to Corinth and other areas of the world. All right, so as we jump into Acts chapter 18, I want to quickly recap what Grace has mentioned before about Paul's journey in chapter 17. And when Paul was in Athens, we've actually seen him having to adapt to the culture of Athens and he um, incorporated all this Greek culture into his teachings as a way for the people of Athens to understand and relate to him. But as Paul now moves from the city of Athens to Corinth, he's going to have to undergo this process of cultural adaptation all over again. So I invite you guys now to open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 18. As we jump into our first verse, we see that Paul has now made himself or he's come into the city of Corinth. Now I want to ask the question, what is and what do we know about the city of Corinth? And what we know is that Corinth was a city filled with lingering immorality. And in fact, it was so immoral in Paul's eyes, he actually wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians as letters to the Corinthian church for ways to address and solve the lingering immorality surrounding the church. But as we continue into verses 2 to 4 of Acts, we see that we are introduced to these two characters named Priscilla and Aquila. So who are Priscilla and Aquila? You know, what are they doing in the city of Corinth? Priscilla and Aquila were actually a couple. They were a married couple and they were actually expelled from Rome. So they didn't leave voluntarily. So that's why they ended up finding their way into Corinth. But I guess the more important question is what kind of a role does Priscilla and Aquila play in Paul's life? Why are they so significant? And this is where I want to introduce us to our first key theme of Acts chapter 18, which is that you are not alone. You don't have to do your ministry alone. And Paul, during his journey, never did. And that wasn't going to change in Corinth. Priscilla, Aquila and Paul were like the sense of familiarity to each other. They all shared the same Jewish heritage, uh, Christian religion, and they even underwent the same tent making profession. And on top of that, Priscilla and Aquila were loyal to each other. They cherished their marriage. And this was something Paul had not even seen yet in the city of Corinth. So their relationship were like a light and blessing to Paul. But as we continue into verses 4 to 6, 
we see that Silas and Timothy have returned from Macedonia. So now Paul is able to, you know, solely dedicate his time to preaching because before he was, um, he was just multitasking between his preaching as well as his tent making profession. But now he's got the time to preach. But it feels like as Paul continues to preach and preach, the more he does this, it feels the more opposition and abuse that he faces. And in fact, the opposition becomes so much for Paul to handle. He, he explodes with anger. And in verse 10, here's something I want to really want to show you actually in verse 6, is that, but when they opposed and insulted him, Paul shook the dust from his clothes and said, your blood is upon your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go preach to the Gentiles. So this was some really harsh words coming from Paul. Honestly, when I read this, I had to take a step back, just process. But when Paul says, your blood is upon your own heads, this is Paul deciding he's not going to take responsibility for the Jews' actions. Whatever consequence the Corinthian Jews come having at them, Paul realizes this is no longer his responsibility because they were so stubborn. And when he continues saying, from now on, I will go preach to the Gentiles, this isn't Paul giving up on the Corinthian Jews. This is Paul realizing that there is no point preaching about God. There's no point preaching God's word to people who aren't ready to listen and to take in what God has to say. But as we continue into verses six to eight, despite all the opposition and abuse that Paul has faced so far, we actually see, you know, a turning point. And this turning point is that Crispus, we're introduced to Crispus, who was at the time the leader of the synagogue. But when he heard Paul preaching, when he heard God's word through Paul, he became so involved in God's word, so inspired, that not only did he get baptized in God's name, so many other Corinthians followed this same path. So despite the opposition and abuse Paul was facing, we still see a silver lining. But as we continue into verse 10, this is Paul's turning point. We see in verse 10, Paul receives a vision from God himself. And it says, don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack and harm you. For many in this, many people in this city belong to me. So now we see... The one, I'm going to relate this back to our first key theme because we see that Priscilla and Aquila has been joining Paul on his mission. But now we also get reassurance from God himself to Paul, the sense of confirmation that God is with Paul throughout his entire journey and he's not going to let Paul do this on his own. And here's where I want to introduce our second key theme of this chapter. And that is, to place Christ at the center of your mission. But why is that? Why is placing God at the center of your mission so successful, so important? And it's because God has placed us on earth with the pure Christian role to unite people to him. And that's exactly what Paul was trying to do. And so God is not going to leave us. He's not going to leave us alone to take upon this mission ourselves. He is going to guide us 100% of the way. But as we continue and we move on into verses 11 to 16, we now see that Paul has actually decided to stay in Corinth for another year and a half. And because of this, the Corinthian Jews are so infuriated. They are so frustrated that Paul is staying. So they actually devise this attack. They decide they're going to take Paul to Galio, who was the proconsul of Achaia. And they're going to say, 
has been preaching these things that go against Roman law. This can't happen. But Goliath knew that this was not the case. He knew what Paul was preaching wasn't going against Roman law. It was going against this personal law that the Corinthian Jews had created. So Paul let them go. He let Paul go. And because of this, the Corinthian Jews were so infuriated, they actually ended up taking all their anger out on this guy named Sosthenes. And who is Sosthenes? He is, well, currently now the synagogue leader. Because before it was Crispus, but we saw that after he was baptized, he resigned his position. And so now we've got Sosthenes as our synagogue leader. But despite being one with the Corinthian Jews, despite following their same ideas, this camaraderie, this partnership that was built between Sosthenes and the Corinthian Jews meant nothing when it came to the anger, the stubbornness that the Corinthian Jews had. So as Paul, you know, leaves Corinth and travels along from what we've just seen, I'm going to introduce us to our second key location of this chapter, which is now Ephesus. And in Ephesus, we, we see that Paul has taken Priscilla and Aquila with him. And before he leaves Corinth, we are actually told that he took up this vow during his time in Corinth. And now what is this vow? You know, it was actually a Nazarite vow that prevented Paul from cutting his hair as a sign of devotion and dedication to God. And you may be thinking, you know, why would Paul take up such a vow? Isn't that so against his nature? But let me remind you, Paul was going to take up this vow because his heritage, his culture is Jewish. And he's not going to erase it. He's going to embrace it. And this was a way for him to adapt to the people of Corinth, to understand their culture. So as we you know, travel along in Ephesus, we now are introduced to a guy named Apollos. And Apollos is this book smart, educated kind of guy. When it came to facts about God, he knew all. And now he's traveling from Alexandria, which was one of the greatest, wealthiest cities of his time, to Ephesus. And Ephesus was this diverse congregation. It was filled with masters, slaves, rulers of the city, middle class working people. And so not only now is Paul undergoing this process of cultural adaptation, we see Apollos going through the exact same thing. And while Apollos was preaching, Priscilla and Aquila saw that what he had to say was very fact-based. It was very surface level knowledge about God. There was no connection. There was no relationship. And Paul, Priscilla and Aquila shared a connection. They shared this bond with each other and with God. So Priscilla and Aquila decided to take it upon themselves to share the relationship that they've had with God to Apollos. And this is where I want to introduce or, you know, take us back to our second key theme again, which was to place Christ at the center of our mission. Because we see now that when Priscilla and Aquila introduced Apollos to this connection with God, Apollos was able to refute his opponents in arguments. He was able to prove Jesus was the Messiah in Scripture by not only combining his education and knowledge about God, he now was placing God at the center of all of his arguments and teachings. He was placing God first. So guys, as I want to close off, I just want to summarize real quick what we've seen in these past two chapters. We've seen that preaching God's word, trying to adapt to other people is not going to be easy. And in fact, we have seen this in Paul. He has struggled. 
over and over again. It felt like the whole world was against him. But as we now know that you are not alone and we place God at the center of your mission, I just want to ask you this one final thought. The next time you're placed in an environment of strangeness, what actions will you take to persevere? Let's pray. Dearest Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much that you are our God, a God who is so willing to work across the globe, work with each other, to unite people together and to unite people to you. And Lord, we've seen, you know, how hard, how intense it can be to push past our limits to do what you want us to do. But Lord, I just thank you that you've provided us with this model, this insight that we know we're not alone and that all we have to do is place you first, give everything to you and we will succeed. So Lord, I ask you to please be with us as we continue our Christian role on earth to unite people to you because we are willing and ready to do so. Lord, I give this prayer in your beloved name. Amen.